Hello everyone, this is Dave Corinth. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I make the Stanley Poor Man's Number One from a 101, as well as the Stanley Bedrock from the 101. So a little backstory, I started making these 101s in 2017, and this is the very first one that I ever made. I had a 101 floating around the shop that I bought in an auction years ago, and it had sat in many places, moved around, and I just never did anything with it. So my son was about eight years old at the time, and he wanted a plane that he could make stuff of his own, but he wanted one that looked like mine that had the toting a knob on it, so this is what I came up with. And after he got tired of it, because he moved on to other things, I put it on eBay. And it sold for a pretty good amount of money, and I realized I could make these little things and actually make some money to buy better planes with, so that's what I did. And it has progressed from this to these and there's a little bit more involved with these than obviously this one but this one took a lot longer to make than it did remake this one or this one and we're going to make one each one of these from these two planes i bought these i don't even know where i bought these to be honest with you um i think this one i got on ebay and this one i got at a flea market for four bucks these are the gray body ones which is the, are the ones I prefer to use when I do this because they are pretty much everywhere. You can get them easily. They're not hard to find. I don't feel guilty about taking one of these and hacking it up to make one of these. I would never do that to one that had some collector value. For instance, this one. This is actually a V logo. I don't know if you can see that or not. Get my little pointer here. Yeah, there's the V logo. This one is from... The teens, early 20s, I don't know when exactly. I know that the V logo was from 1910 to 1918, but I don't know if they used it after that on block planes. <clears throat> so this one is somewhat collectible. If they ever say Stanley Ruling Level on them, on the logo, I won't use them. If they ever have an S casting or a 101 stamped in them, or not stamped, but cast into them, I won't touch those. Those, I think, are collectible and don't need to be hacked up and convert it into this. We're gonna get into this detail, how we're gonna do this step by step, and then we will make two of them out of these two. So here I'm just cutting these pinch pins out. It's less chance of me damaging the sides. Sometimes those get in there really good and I don't want to damage the sides, so I cut them out. I'm not going to reuse them, so it's just easier to cut them out. They're going to get replaced with a bigger pinch pin anyways. So here I'm just milling that little nib on the back of the body. This needs to be milled perfectly flat so the tote can seat to the body real well. The first time I did this, I used a file, and it took me a long time. Having this end mill has definitely sped the process up. This being the Bedrock 101, I need to mill these top rails from round to flat. I take it nice and slow, not to get in a hurry. Just a few passes will take it down to the desired height making sure not to get too close to that pinch pin hole. If you got that too thin and then pinged the brass pin in, you could actually crack the sides of the rails and I don't want to do that. So I leave a little bit of meat there so they can accept that new pinch pin. Here's 
Here I'm milling the index off. The index is where you would put your finger using one of these thumb planes, but we're going to put a knob there and having it flat makes it a whole lot easier to attach the knob. Again, having this end mill definitely speeds the process up. So sandblasting gets rid of all the old paint, gets it every little nook and cranny, and gives a good surface for the new paint to adhere to. That duplicolor closely mimics the original Japaning. At first, it's a little bit too shiny, so I'll buff that with wax and get that shine down a little bit, and it'll look more like the original Japaning. So this is the piece of brass that will support that faux adjustment knob. This is machined very tight so that it's a friction fit finish when I put it in there. That little piece of brass will sit between the two upright rails, which from the foundry have a one to two degree draft to allow it to be pulled out of the sand. This needs to be milled parallel with each other. That allows this little piece of brass, which will support the threaded rod that accepts the faux adjustment knob. The next thing we're gonna do is drill these little holes out to accept the brass pinch pins, which are one eighth of an inch. Use a one eighth inch drill bit to drill those through. So I got the holes drilled. Those one eighth inch brass pins just slide right in. They'll have to be peened over later to make sure they stay in place. So before I put the pinch pins in and peen them, I like to file the seats. I hold it in with a vise, not tight, just enough to hold it snug so I don't damage the body. Use a very thin file that will allow it to go through that mouth. So here, I'm drilling the hole, the tab, for the 1032 threaded rod that will accept the adjustment knob. I tap these by hand and put a piece of brass on the bottom. When I hit that brass, I know I want to stop. Doing this allows that threaded rod to be tightened down without coming loose or having to use any kind of adhesive on it. This will get cut down to about three quarters of an inch, maybe a little longer, and then the end of it gets sanded first with a file and then with sandpaper to give it a rounded look like you would see on a full-size bench plane. Once I put it in the vise, I just turn it down, crank it a couple times, and it tightens up. That ain't coming out. So here, I've made myself a little 90 degree block so that when I drill these holes, they are perfectly square with the body. I did the same thing when I drilled the pinch pin holes, but of course I forgot to hit record. As I get ready to drill the holes, I notice there's a problem. You can see the drill bit going down, and it should go through that cast iron like butter, but it's not. The drill bit is actually wobbling because it can't go through those rails. The problem is, is that when this plane was taken out of the sand mold, the casting was taken out before it could cool down properly, and that air hardens any small sharp points. The top rails on this little plane are hardened, and I mean hardened. You can see how shiny they are right there. Any of those little tiny top points will be very, very hard. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go to plan B, and plan B will involve epoxy. So plan B is using epoxy. You can see here, I'm just spreading it on the inside of those rails. It's a marine grade epoxy, very strong. It'll hold that little brass support perfect. I use a clamp to hold it down. Not a lot of pressure, just enough to keep it in place.
So doing the same thing I did with the Bedrock 101, I'm just gonna file the seat of this one. Only this one has the brass that has to be filed as well. I know a lot of people are cringing right now because they see that belt sander. And belt sanders are kind of a no-no in the world of hand planes. But for this, it works the best. Doing it by hand just takes way too long. And this also flushes down those brass pinch pins on the sides. I don't let it get hot. I take my time. And the results turn out pretty good. Here I'm just removing the finish off that indent that was milled flat earlier. I got this little carbide scraper in a box of junk a couple years ago at an auction and it works great for taking paint off the top rails. Once I remove all that paint, I'll take some 220 grit sandpaper, sand them smooth so they're nice and clean to the touch. I also hit the sides right after this to kind of smooth that out as well. I use 5 eighths of an inch thick genuine rosewood for the totes. Here I'm tracing out the tote for the Bedrock 101. It is not the same for the poor man's. For the poor man's 101, I use a tote design that looks more like a number one tote. When I trace these out, I look for unique spots on the board to select. In this case, I had enough space between the two to trace out another tote. So while I was at it, I went ahead and cut those out as well. After I cut these on the bandsaw, I take a file and remove the bandsaw marks, smoothing them out. Well, if I had hit record, you would have seen me route the totes with a one quarter inch round over bit. I fit each tote to the plane, this being the Bedrock 101, to make sure that the tote doesn't interfere with the iron. I want the iron to almost touch the tote with about a 1 16th gap. On the poor man's, I want the iron to go over the top of the tote and leave about a quarter inch sticking out the back. When I turn these, I always try to turn two at a time. In this case, I'm turning two that are not the same. The height for the poor man's number one is 13 sixteenths, while the height for the Bedrock 101 is one and one eighth. Both of them are 13 sixteenths in diameter. I have made myself a custom set of tools for this job and used them only to cut these totes. Here, I'm cutting the waist for the poor man's number one. And here, I'm cutting the waist for the Bedrock 101. Anytime I turn rosewood, as soon as I'm done, I wash my hands, but I don't like to wear gloves using my lathe. I take some 220 grit sandpaper to clean them up and then cut them down further so that I can cut them off on the bandsaw. For the final shaping of the totes, I use a rasp to curve the horn and the toe. 
I also use the rasp to take the flat spot off the top from left over from when I routed them with the quarter inch round over bit. I do all this by hand and it takes a long time. Once I'm done shaping each, I then take 220 grit sandpaper followed by 4 ot steel wool to polish them. I use a quarter inch Forstner bit to drill the holes for the barrel nuts. They go down about 5 sixteenths of an inch. I do the same for the tote and for the knob. I use one quarter inch brass rod to make the barrel nuts. They're five sixteenths of an inch long and I measure their depth by placing each one in the hole and then marking the end of it and then cutting it out on a bandsaw. I use a 3 seconds drill bit to drill the holes for the tote and for the knob. Cast iron soft so it's not a hard task at all. So this is where I'm going to drill that countersink from the underside that will take those brass screws. I use a 7 seconds drill bit to make the countersink. I go nice and easy, cast iron soft, and it's easy to drill all the way through. These only need to be deep enough to where the brass screw just sticks up on top of the sole of hair. The finish I use on the tote and the knob is lacquer, about three coats, and I let it sit 24 hours before I do any polishing. To make these look really good, I spend a lot of time on the tote and knob. I use 4 ot steel wool to polish each in the same direction as the grain. Once it's been polished with the 4 ot steel wool, I follow it up with a cotton rag. This can take quite a while to do, but the end result is worth it. I give the same treatment to each knob, getting in every nook and cranny. The polishing step here is probably one of the most important steps to make these look good. I set the barrel nuts in the tote and the knob using epoxy. It doesn't take much, just enough to lock it in place. I push them down on the knob to where it's just flush with the top. For the tote, I want those to be pushed down a little bit below, and I use a screwdriver to push it down in. I also clock each one so that the slot is perpendicular to the length of the plane. I do this on both the tote and the knob. Of course, using a very small screwdriver. The tote and knob are attached from the underside with the number 6 brass screws. After I have the knob where I want it, I recheck the clocking to make sure it is perpendicular to the length of the plane. The tote gets secured the same way from the underside with the number six brass screw.
I make my screw caps out of brass, and this is one quarter inch thick by one inch wide brass bar stock. I then mill the slot for the pinch pin using a one eighth inch ball tail end mill. This works the best I've found. I used to use a rat tail file, but it just took forever, and I didn't get consistent results. With this ball tail end mill, each one is identical. I set them down a little bit deeper than one half the diameter of the pinch pin, or a little over one sixteenth of an inch. For the poor man's number one, the screw cap has to be a little bit thinner since it's iron, it's thicker. So here I'm milling off a little bit off the back so that iron can sit in there. Here I'm drilling a hole preparing to tap for the set screw. The set screw is a stainless steel knurled 1032 set screw. I tap these on the drill press but turn it by hand. Brass isn't that hard to tap especially when it's this small and I find I get better control doing this. I test fit each one as soon as it's tapped. The top of the screw cap has an OG shape, and to cut that, I go back to the end mill using a one half inch end mill bit to cut that, taking small cuts on each side. The radius on the top of the screw cap is shaped using my sanding center with 180 grit. I also shaped the profile on the toe of the screw cap. I lap the back of each screw cap using 220 grit sandpaper. This removes all those machine marks. I then flip it over and do the same thing to the front. Starting with the 34th plane made, I began to put this stamp on the back of each screw cap. These two planes will be numbers 50 and 51, and each will receive that number on the back of the cap to identify it as such. Once it's stamped, I polish it using some Scotch-Brite on the front and the back. Since the tote and knob are secured from the bottom underside, the brass screws need to be lapped flat with the sole. I'm using 220 grit sandpaper here to ensure that each sole is flat, followed by some more Scotch-Brite to polish things off. I clean the iron for the Bedrock 101, which is an original Stanley and has some surface rust on it with 220 grit sandpaper. I then go over that with Scotch-Brite. Again, this leaves a nice smooth finish.
I lap the back of the iron on these diamond stones. These are very narrow, only one inch wide, and they work great for these small planes. I take that up to 1200 grit. I then use a 3000 grit water stone to lap the back, and then hone a five degree secondary bevel by hand on the same stone. The fit and finish on any plane is extremely important. It makes it look better. And here I'm using Scotch Brite to polish the sole and the sides and then going over the whole thing with Johnson's Paste Wax. Once I've given it a good coat, I'll let that sit for a little while, 15-20 minutes, and then go back with a cotton rag and polish the whole plane up. The longer you take on this, the better it'll look. And finally, it's time to assemble each one. The iron for the Bedrock 101 comes in from the underside since the tote is in the way. The iron for the Poor Man's number 1 goes in like a standard plane from the top. For the poor man's number one, this is the only the second time I've ever made the slot at the top. So I forgot to do it when I made the plane initially. So I went back in and drilled the top hole using a 3 8 inch end mill and then slotted it with the 3 16 bit. This of course will have to be repolished. And now the best part of working on hand planes and that is to actually see how well it makes a shaving. The little bedrock is set up with a straight profile on the iron, so it will take a full shaving the width of the iron. The little poor man's number one is set up with a smoothing profile, so it only takes a bite out of the center portion of the iron. Well, that's how I make them. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you're gonna make one, have fun too. These are a blast to make. Definitely fun to do. And each one can be unique. Choose different woods. Make a different cap. Either way, have fun with it. That's the whole point of this. I hope you enjoy watching this video.